Okay, so we're back to the development from 1870 to 1900. Um, basically, there was modest growth in the area. There was a sawmill set up near New Brighton. East Park, now known as Hastings Park, was established. And then a number of large parcels was, were sold off on government auction. So this was the plan. This was the original plan um, from 1869. And it shows where the church, the hospital, the government buildings were all set aside to, to happen. But they never did. Instead, what we have are the hotels. And the Hastings Hotel and Stable is that modest looking building on the bottom of the picture. And the one that's more well known is the later Brighton Hotel from 1880 up on the, up on the shore. Great idea. We have an excellent view. Yeah. So Hastings Hotel was uh, originally set up, as I said, it was set up as the Brighton Hotel, but um, it was later acquired by a man, uh, Maximilian Michaud, in, in, uh, shortly after it was set up, and then it was changed to the Hastings Hotel. So the, the, um, the house to the right, when I first saw this picture, I thought that was the hotel because the house to the left really looked like more of a, well, a pretty basic building that I'm not sure what would stay in. But it turns out the house on the right was much later from about 1880. And um, to visualize where the buildings were, the hotel would have been roughly in front of the pool entry area. And the house would be pretty much where the pool building is now, just off to the, the left side of the pool building. There was a stable directly behind the hotel, hidden in the trees, you can't see in this picture, which is right next to the creek that flowed down into the Road. This is the Eastman's Hotel. The Brighton Hotel was uh, more popular and more well known, uh, built around 1880. Um, the life of the hotels was fairly short-lived, as you'll see in a moment. George Black was known as the Laird of Hastings, and I always wondered, well, what does Laird mean? So I have to look it up. But it's generally applied to the owner of an estate, sometimes by the owner himself, or more commonly, by those living and working on the estate. It's a description rather than a title, and it's not appropriate for the owner of a normal residential property. Well, I don't think this is a normal residential property. Uh, far less the owner of a small souvenir plot of land. It goes without saying the term Laird is not synonymous with that of Lord or Lady. In other words, it was a bit of a stretch to call George Black the Laird of Hastings, but anyway, he was. But within uh, a short number of years, the Hastings Hotel disappeared, the creek was filled in, roads were moved, and railway tracks were expanded, and uh, sadly, the Brighton Hotel was destroyed by fire in 1905. Suspicious. <laughs> so now to give, you, to give you the context of the lost hotels, where they were located. <coughs> so the blue line there is the original shoreline. And the, you can't see it very well, but the creek is located just to the right of where the uh, Hastings Hotel was, and going down really where the underpass is that goes to where the, the pool building is. And the new Brighton, the Brighton Hotel was located about 100 feet north of where the playground is located now. So on to the next deciding factor, trains. And as we all know, the Canadian Pacific Railway had an uh, enduring effect in Vancouver in many ways, shapes and forms. Um, really, the roles of trains and streetcars really had an enduring effect and can't be understated. The 1913 fire insurance map that you see on the right there uh, shows where the New Brighton Hotel once stood uh, in Brown. Now the site is vacant. And the area expanded with industries. To the, uh, to the right of that, there's a number of shingle mills. There's Kirkpatrick Shingle Mill and Nairn Shingle Mill located to, uh, east of where the creek came down. The Hastings Hotel is long gone, likely obliterated when the railway came through, as the lots were right in the way of the CPR tracks. But the, um, the original site of the Hastings Hotel, outlined in blue, you can see next to it the fancier house that was next to it still is there in 1913. 
the arrival of Engine 374 was pretty well the nail in the coffin. It sealed the deal for Hastings. There were industry, businesses, and housing sprang up around where the railway came in. And that was Granville Town Site, by the way, close to the Vancouver. So the, the next point was about the lack of government. And here you can see in red on the, the, the larger map of the region, uh, Hastings Town Site aligned in red. It was one of a number of plots of provincial government lands. And even in the early days, before there was a province, it was overseen by the colony of uh, British Columbia, which was based in Westminster. So there really wasn't anybody in charge, per se. They laid out the streets, and they, called, they gave the names to the, to the streets, and, and they pretty well left it back. So exactly what they had in mind remains a mystery to this day. And if anybody knows, I, I, I'd like to know. But there certainly was land speculation happening in this area like there was in many other parts of Vancouver. What it uh, brought about was initially those 66-foot lots were located from, from Wall Street down to Cambridge Street. Um, and to the south of that were undivided blocks. Those are entire blocks you see there, uh, with 66-foot lengths of way. And further to the south, south of roughly Pender Street or Turner Street, were quarter-acre parcels. So very rural in nature. Eventually, the blocks south of Cambridge were divided into 33-foot lots. And over time, even the lots up here, there aren't very many of them that are 66. There's probably about five or six that are still about 66-foot frontage. So development was modest and scattered. The streetcar was one of the important things that happened around 1910, which came in along the Gill Street and connected residents of the town site to Vancouver and really opened up the area for development. And as you can see, it follows the trolley line. The trolley bus goes that same route. The only difference is on the far left of that map, it comes up Eaton Street. It doesn't go down the middle. So it had a little bit of a funny jog over in the, the part, uh, part of the the city it was, it was actually part of the city of Vancouver, not Hastings Town Site. And then on to the boom and the bust. Um, the opportunities. Well, the opportunities were sort of thin in this area. Um, employment in the early days of the Hastings Town Site was limited, and of course, there were no workplace safety standards. Um, what you see here is a body which has been covered by a number of um, pieces of clothing. Um, the term boom and bust is taken literally, in this case, the boom part. Um, lots were cleared, more or less. The giant stumps were still there from the old growth forest, and they had to be cleared by blowing them up with dynamite. And in this case, the end result was deadly. In North Burnaby, it was documented that the city had to implement blasting bylaws to regulate the amount of blasting going on during the day. It probably, probably wasn't the case in Hastings because there was no one to, to implement the bylaws here, at least not prior to the town site joining the city. So what was there in terms of pre-1910 development? Well, one of the um, uh, critical pieces was the creation of a school because there were a few more people coming in. They had kids. The kids had nowhere to go to school. They finally got a one-room schoolhouse built, um, which was followed in 1908, followed by a two-room school in 1910. And the one room school is located, was located on the, the site of Hastings Elementary School, except it was on the far east side of the site, in Slocan and Pandora. And another school built in 1910 to accommodate the growing population. So if you want to visualize the area at the time, you can think of dirt roads, no sidewalks, many vacant lots with scrub and small trees, and not really much of a focus to the community. The early days in the 1910s, well, things were starting to evolve once the hotels disappeared, the railway tracks were coming through, there was more opportunity for industry, certainly along the waterfront. Kirkpatrick's Shingle Mill and Nairn's Mill were down in New Brighton by this time. The Vancouver Exhibition was being set up in 1910. Hastings Park Racetrack had been there um, much earlier than that, in 1890 or so. Um, and the Gill Streetcar line, you can see the, the term of the 7th Street car going from the Eaton Street. But you can really see, even by this, this photograph is 1919, you can see how underdeveloped the area was. Really. 
scattered houses here and there. So around 1910, a lot of people were thinking, okay, like, let's get back together here and let's think about what are we going to do? Are we going to just keep it the way it is, or are we going to um, are we going to do something that's going to stimulate growth in the area and promote the area and get the area going? Well, the one way to do that was annexation of the city of Vancouver. And that was prompted by the need for better transportation, for servicing, basic things like water and sewer, amenities. If we think of sidewalks as being anything fancy, there were no sidewalks at that time. And just general business and economic development. So there you can see the, the McGill Streetcar at Renfrew, which um, connects to the <coughs> Park. And shortly after the annexation, uh, 1912, the fire hall, number 14, was built at Cambridge and North Slocan. So who was the driving force here? Well, there were a number of people, I'm sure, who were promoting this, but Frank Woodside is the one who really stands out. He was a key leader in the Residents' Association, which was established in 1909, and eventually led a petition to the province to um, have an annexation with the city of Vancouver. Uh, the local vote was held in 1910, and um, there was another vote, I think, prior to that that didn't go very well. But they, they got themselves back together and had another vote in late 1910, and it was overwhelming. I think it was one person against it. Um, the province approved the amalgamation in early 1911. And that was the first expansion of its original values. And Frank Woodside's house is still sitting there at 2594 Eaton Street. Commercial growth. Well, going back to that layout of the, the large lots on the 99 foot rights of way, that downtown, if it was to be there, it would materialize. So, what took its place? Well, corner stores, they provided the essentials. And they didn't just sell cigarettes or candy, they sold everything and anything, or else you had it delivered. The streetcar then also was the lifeline, getting goods or getting to work. And three of the key corner stores that were associated pretty close to the uh, streetcar line, or on that line, the Guild Grocery, uh, that's the original Guild Grocery up there, um, and Park Grocery Woodside Apartments, which is still there in Eaton and Tipton, and the Eaton Grocery, no longer there, but it was at Eaton. So the commercial development did occur on Hastings Street, um, but it was really slow and sporadic. Um, you can see the kind of store at the top there, that's the Forest's department store uh, from the late 30s. And very small scale, very modest development. Now, Forest did um, expand into uh, a larger building, which is still there today. Um, and they had a quite a significant department store, played a very important role in the local area. Safeway is a grocery store, you can see the size of it, it's not the, the Safeway that you know today. And then institutional development. This area was ripe for that kind of development, primarily because land was plentiful, cheap, and it was away from people who didn't want to see these sorts of things. These were the aspects of society that were really not things that people wanted to think about. The Children's Aid Home, which was right over here in the park, uh, built in 1906, which housed up to 200 children. And um, the foundations are still there. If you go around the park, you'll see the foundations of that building. <coughs> and the Girls Industrial School, a little bit later, uh, built in 1914 on Cassia. That building is still there as well. So the, the, the end result was the Children's Aid Home was condemned for its conditions. Um, even by the 1920s, they, they knew it wasn't the right way of housing large numbers of children. Um, it was condemned for lack of fire safety predominantly, and probably just the fact that there were not many children in a building um, with not a lot of um, education and guidance. And um, the girls' industrial school on Cassiar Street. Um, but I've read up on this a little bit. Most girls were in there, they were committed to for the offense of being incorrigible, whatever that meant. Um, they were ranging age from 13 to 16 years, and later the age was raised to 20 years. And as the city grew up around the, the girls' school, the, the programs changed from gardening and animal husbandry to school work and household arts. Cool. 
documentation from the 1940s indicates there was a mix of hardened girls, as they were called, and the mistaken ones. Those are the quotes. Uh, the mistaken ones were, but the, the challenges of dealing with these two groups under the same program facility were, were apparent from the documentation. So what happened, at least with the, um, the orphanage, it was changed to, it was torn down to the Babies College, the building we're in now, it was built in 1925. The strategy uh, by the early 20s was they, they wanted to downsize the facilities, make them more humane. Um, and there were a number of other buildings, at least three other buildings of this same style that were planned for the park that were never built. Because by the mid-20s, they had seen what was happening in the East and Ontario and other places, and the strategy shift from, shifted from having children in these sort of buildings uh, to moving into foster homes. And by the 1930s, the juvenile detention home was built next to here, uh, which later became the family. Hastings Park, of course, that played a critical role in Hastings Town Site and still does to the state. Um, very important piece of land. And, and really, it's a presentation unto itself. It featured a number of ornate buildings. You can see one of them here. Uh, the pre predate the cast concrete ones that uh, were built in the 1930s and 40s. As fancy as the building looks, you can believe that they were not structurally sound. Um, they were wood frame and they were, they were basically condemned and had to be torn down. The park was also used in um, the early years of World War I as a training ground for the 29th Battalion. So you can see the photograph there. And unfortunately also has the more dubious distinction of being used for the processing and internment of Japanese Canadians in 1942. Hastings Elementary School, which you saw earlier, now this is the schools we know today. We built in two sections, and it gives an idea, a school I think is really an indicative factor of how a, a community is developing and growing. The needs of uh, education had to be met by building a, a large school. And um, so the school as we know it today was built in two sections. In 1912, this section, a very ornate looking building, as you can see it today, it was a lot of that ornate detail was unfortunately removed. And that was the main entrance facing Pandora. And which is still there today, of course, but it's just a stairway up to some windows. The neighborhood growth and activity, as I mentioned before, really revolves around a number of things, commercial activity, schools, other social activities. And you can see the two sections of the school. By 1925, it expanded to its full size as we know it today. It more than doubled in size in 1925. And when they they put the, the addition on here. You can see it was many years before they actually chopped off all the ornate brickwork and stonework on the, the original 1912 section. And to get a sense of the other activities in the area, well, the photograph on the left really gives a sense of what the neighborhood looked like. This was the more developed part of the neighborhood, though, I should emphasize. Dundas Street and that area, the proximity to Nanaimo Street here, it's more developed, although you can see that uh, this is part of the 29th Battalion again, training in what were empty lots, like the entire block was almost empty and they had that as uh, their free land to train in. Uh, 1919, you can see the, the um, situation down by New Brighton. The, the mills are large and expanded, uh, the railway tracks have expanded, and pretty well nothing is left of what was there originally, except you can see that little white house sitting in the middle, that 1880 house is still miraculously there. I'm not sure how long it lasted after that. And Callister Park, of course, um, played an important role in social and recreational activities. There was a rodeo held there in the 40s. There was um, a grandstand, which um, was used predominantly for soccer and lacrosse, but also the games of the 1960s, there's some evidence that would be used for uh, smash up derbies, demolition derbies as well, uh, before it was converted back to just green space. And it was originally known as Con Jones Park, Con Jones being the guy who put up the money for the grandstand. So the neighborhood continued to evolve. It was really in a stop and start manner. It, it was still somewhere wavering between semi-urban and rural. There were large
large blocks that were still vacant. There were lots of scrub and bush and a few houses here and there. But through the 20s, the, the houses started to develop and blocks began to fill in. But I think it's interesting to see even in um, the 1933 uh, city directory, it was called East End Dairy at 2469 Oxford Street. And that uh, is where um, the Kawasa neighborhood house is now. So there were still large blocks that supported rural or uh, agricultural activities such as this. And jumping ahead to where we are now in terms of heritage sites in uh, the area that we commonly know as Hastings Town Site, specifically the area on Hastings Street. There are 45 buildings and one monument that are on the Heritage Register. You can see they're fairly well distributed around. Most of them are houses, 82% are houses. 13% um, of them are institutional buildings, many of them are Hastings Park and, uh, of course, the school buildings, uh, and one church as well. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. What project will you work on next? Uh, well, <laughs> Knowing that I only have 20 minutes, I'm pretty sure I went over it by, by a lot of time. Um, then you could talk and you'd have a whole presentation on Hastings Park. There's so much to say about that over the many decades. It's such an interesting story. Um, the houses in the area, I purposely left those out, as you might have noticed, because there, there are many interesting houses, both large and small, and many interesting people have lived in the area, too. So there's a couple more presentations, at least. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's areas of, I mean, it's not all the areas, but like on my block and some other blocks, it seems there seems to be a pattern of an older house, like a 1912 house followed by a, 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 a 1920 or 30 house. Yeah. So, but what strikes me is, so did, did they know they were going to allow subdivisions? Because so, the houses were obviously built, like on my, I was, you know, obviously my house is on a lot that was subdivided. Yeah. But the house was obviously perfectly located so they could subdivide the lot. So was yeah. it a pattern that people built on part of the lot? Or was it or did they know it was going to be there's subdivided? there's evidence of that when you look at the nineteen thirteen fire insurance map, there are houses that are, are they look purposely built to one side. Yeah. And then later on the, the property is subdivided. Yeah, that seems to so, happen everywhere in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, that was all over Vancouver. Yeah. Even yeah. even today, once in a while somebody will sell a property and then they can sort of subdivide. Yeah. And now of course that's all governed by the subdivision bylaw that gives a minimum lot size and the frontages and so yeah. on. Uh, back then there wasn't any such regulation and probably they they, well, they saw that people didn't really need or want sixty six foot lots. So they just you think people just purposely built on part of it thinking that they were speculating. Yeah. They were and in fact so we see even other cases where there are two houses built on one lot and they're ready to sell Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's all over the city. Yeah. 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 And 33 feet is the standard, certainly from the east side. The west side is more 40 feet, but, but it's in, yeah, in around that range. If you really look at like a lot of streets, you know, it goes old house, the like older house, like 1915 a house, next houses earlier. You know, and they get the newer houses vary from, I think, like the 20s to like the 50s. So it seems to yeah. me that it's just interesting it doesn't yeah. look like that everyone, there's all these older houses and by newer houses. There, there is a way to research your house. You can go into the archives and what, what's the permission to get into the archives? To you just to go there and you, you can uh, look up the, the water application yeah. dates, the building permits. Um, there are no permits between 1905 and 1908, but in this area there are very few buildings from that era anyway. Um, so you can get the, uh, you find out who was the original owner, who was the architect, if there was one, when the, when the building was connected to water. Those are critical dates. And then the city directories, they're available online through the Vancouver Public Library. Yeah. Yeah. What about this map? Is this a personal map or is that a city registry? Well, this, this is a map actually that was produced by the Vancouver Heritage Foundation quite recently. It's not exactly, it's taken from the city's database, which can be a uh, Explain why. <laughs> it's it's a little bit complicated in that you see Hastings Park is only one dot there. You know, there's a number of buildings in Hastings Park that are registered, so it doesn't quite capture everything, but it does capture. Fairly so, well. if we want, we're interested in the building in the area, you can go to the heritage. 
to the this is the Matthew Marriage Foundation. Yeah, and they've done it now. The, that, um, that dairy there, that, that's a little bit misleading because uh, the milk was delivered into the 1950s by a horse cart. I, I can actually remember that as a child. And mm -hmm. We'd jump on the cart and pretend we were riding a horse, but the horse knew where to go and milk went back and forth. Yeah. And as they say, that carried on into the 50s. So what they actually were, was they were called dairies, but they were actually distribution points and they had to be throughout the city at a reasonable uh, <coughs> distance mm -hmm. that in the morning the, 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 the roots could all be covered from a dairy mm -hmm. um, for, for an area. And the one, the one on uh, Broadway, and I forget the cross street in Kitsilino there, it, it was still in use and still had horses <coughs> on there until about 1957, you know, because I, I lived near that one. And, uh, but but I, that's, that's what I say, that term I think is a bit misleading. It isn't, it's more of a distribution point mm -hmm. than, than an outright dairy with cows yeah. and everything. Well, I didn't, yeah, I didn't visualize the cows there necessarily, no. but yeah, it was still sort of that different sort of way of getting products to people. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to the corner stores which offer everything and anything, pretty much, you know, for groceries or, or uh, delivery as well. No, it might come in from the valley on, on, on the tram on the yeah. 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 I was going to say that one of the things that we love so much about this neighborhood is that it's not densely populated like kids and it's not overdeveloped. And the perspective here is that, you know, this part of town was neglected in some ways from development over mm -hmm. early on. And mm -hmm. the great thing is that maybe it resulted in this lack of, you know, densely populated or lack of overdevelopment. You know. It's a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. Because that really is why you have such a variety of character, a lot of buildings. And this this is only this shows only the buildings on the register. There are many, many character buildings that aren't aren't shown here. There are many, many more mm -hmm. of varying ages and styles. Um, just in terms of the subdivision of the lots and the um, situation situating of the houses, it could have been um, in <coughs> some cases people who built their house and then thought the other half would be a house that they would build for their well, children as their children grew up or, or knowing that they would need need the money um, um, to sell oh, off. The building on one side of your lot was right across Canada from Nova Scotia to BC. They had septic tiles. They had, um, they had to have the land. And when we all got on sewers, the septic tiles went, the septic tanks went, and you had sidewalks, and and you expected your family to grow, and you expected to build a house for your family. We now move all over the place. Yeah. And, and also, I think it could have been speculation. It could have just been that somebody who wanted to have a wide side yard, too. Um, it's hard to see on this map. This is the 1913. Now you can see some lots where there are two houses, others where there's one situated definitely it's over to one side or the other. Some it's just <coughs> houses are in the middle of lots. Right? And families were much larger. Families were much larger. Houses. They were. We have six kids, five kids, seven yeah. kids. So you needed the land. And take the split. And that used they had yeah. three girls. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you comment on the street names and the some change. Well, yeah, uh, the best thing is to read the book, the street names of that Hebrew book, but I can tell you a little bit of the names, and they were given by the whoever was overseeing in the provincial level. Um, as Frank Woodside was quoted on this sometime before he died, that the, the names of the north south streets were given, they were names of mining districts. And he, he was actually, he was. Uh, heavily into the mining industry, mining at the time, but he said he didn't have all that. Um, and it was the powers that be that also named the, the north south streets after the universities. Uh -huh. Education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except for Wall Street. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Pan yeah. Pandora and Triumph, yeah. they're a little bit uncertain. They speculate they were named after um, ships, mm -hmm. British ships. So, yeah. 
It didn't Wall Street get its name? It was originally going to be Powell. It was in Powell. That's why Powell changed it was its name to yes. Dundas. Yeah, Powell and Dundas time. shifted back and forth, and Wall was called Powell for a while. Excuse me, can I just ask Wall Street there? And um, when you go, or uh, one, two, three, four, if you go in, what is that when there's a square inside the, the lots? Does that signify? Because I'm self absorbed because I think that's, that's my place. So that, that's the only house that's there, that block? Oh, uh, well, the middle block the wall on the north side? Yeah. yeah. That's a house. Oh, that might have been nice. <laughs> 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 oh, that's very interesting. Unfortunately, the, the fire insurance maps only are a snapshot in time because the next one is 1927 28. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. the, what's the deal with um, the north, the, the, the properties that were surveyed on the north side of Wall Street were actually surveyed to 20 feet from the high water mark, and then the, the railway was a little bit late. They, they, in fact, that's why they pushed it through the year after they went to Port Moody, because they realized if they didn't get to the bigger inlet, Rard Inlet, as opposed to Port Moody, yeah. they, they would lose it. And I understand that's why at the, the sugar mill, that was already private property, so the railway goes behind it. Yeah. And, but on Wall Street, on my title, it says that the, the railway, the right-of-way, is, is an easement on my property. Interesting. My title. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, my understanding is that the railway was just a little too late when they had to use the Railways Act to to, to get right of way. Right away through the various properties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Williston, which is west of Victoria Drive, is a designated train station. Right. That's why it's called Williston Yards. But mm -hmm. from there, eastwards, they actually aren't supposed to be shunting in that because it's right of way. Mm. I know, like, I, my, I just retired a couple of years ago. And my job had me going out and across the little bridge at the foot of Nanaimo that's been removed recently yeah. at all hours of the night. <clears throat> and I know if I phoned in that there was an engine idling there, within about 15 minutes it stopped because they were very, in my understanding, they were very sensitive but the fact that technically they have right of way, not CPR land. Mm -hmm. um, it was that was researched uh, a few years ago as part of the EDPL plan. Some of the properties, well, first of all, it's really hard to research it because it goes back to the 1800s, and, and I also understand CP Rail isn't all that cooperative, letting people into their mm -hmm. archives. Um, but apparently, some properties were actually purchased by CP Rail. All the street ends, I think the city still actually technically owns them. Like the street right, ends, they do, yeah. Yeah, That's right true. down yeah. under the railway to, yeah. I'm not sure how far, but because the port, then the, the port, railway. it gets a little yeah. bit gray because the, the port then has jurisdiction. And they can basically do whatever they want to. We know. You know. Yeah, we know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The city can zone things yeah. the way, a certain way, but the port can say, well, we want to do this. Last question from Kate. Um, I see there are lots showing in the 2600 block of Yale Street, which is now um, Burrard View Park. Yeah. Um, so were there ever houses there or? Yeah, there was a, there was a house there. And if I ever give another presentation, you know, have probably on houses, that would be one of them. There was a house that dates back, um, a pioneer family that built what Clinton Manor, called yeah. mm -hmm. uh, across the lane. And we have the same family who built the house with the corn showing right there at Yale and, uh, and Clinton in yeah, particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it was eventually used as an administrative building for, for this facility here, for the family court and, and so on. And uh, it was, I think it was a receiving house for the, the babies, the, the babies college. Um, but uh, yeah, it was there for many years. And when was for our view park created? Um, it, I'm not sure, I think it was in the 1920s, but I couldn't give you an exact date. Um, and they would have also acquired all the properties from the of Yale, that's the best part of the park. And Yale yep. um, still, as a right-of-way, runs through the park, but of course it's 
Okay, thank you very much, you folks. Yes, thank you.